Amen. Thank you, Pastor. It is a blessing to be with you tonight. You can take your Bibles, turn to Matthew 16. We'll get there in a little while. It is a blessing. We are beginning our fourth year as a director, missions director for the Association of Independent Baptist Churches of Illinois. Uh, of course, the uh, AIBCI stands for that. And um, I know sometimes the idea of association and independent sounds a little bit like an oxymoron. Uh, but it really isn't. It is an opportunity for us as churches here in the state of Illinois to work together. Um, I often think, you know, as churches, we do it with, with foreign missions all the time. We, uh, I don't think your church, our church, I don't know if any of our local churches uh, support missionaries completely all the, by themselves. Um, we, we, we help each other. Um, the average missionary, when he goes to the foreign field, will have between 60 and 80 churches that support him and have a part uh, in their ministry. And our, our goal is to be able to start churches here in the state of Illinois. And uh, God has blessed us. The last church, of course, was in Shorewood. Uh, Brother Barber, his family, they're doing wonderful. They purchased a building. God has been blessing them. Uh, they are doing well uh, financially and and of course, whenever God does good things, Satan works and attacks as well. Uh, they've had some attacks in the last year, have lost some families. Uh, but the Lord has seen fit to just continue to bring others in. And uh, God continues to work there. And so it's been a blessing um, to see what God is doing and has done uh, there uh, in Shorewood. And uh, so we're excited about that. We're praying. I hope you are. We're praying for the uh, Bible says, pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And uh, we're praying for God to send laborers. Uh, it basically takes three things to start a, start a church. And that is people, uh, of course, no shortage of people. Uh, even, even though people are moving out of Illinois, we still have a few. And uh, we thank the Lord for that. I, I've pastored in two states in my life, New York and Illinois, and people are moving out of those states faster than anywhere else. I don't know if it's me, I don't know what it is, but somewhere along the line, the, the people are moving out. But we still have people, don't we? And there's still people to reach. And uh, God wants us to continue at that. And so uh, we thank the Lord. It takes people, but it also takes churches. Um, again, money, support. And then it takes a family or a man, takes or a group of men, if you will, uh, f several uh, families to uh, come together to start a church. And uh, so we're praying for God to lead, to work in, in hearts. Uh, we want God to bring a man to us, and we're endeavoring to put the feelers out and do everything we can to try to find someone. Uh, but uh, God has God has not seen fit at this point, at least. Uh, to give us a new, a new church planter, but we're still working towards that end. And I'll be praying for that. I hope you will I'll be praying for that, um, whether it's uh, wherever. Uh, just the Lord, Lord knows where the next one will be. But along the way, uh, as I've had opportunity to be in churches and like yours, um, we sure appreciate your faithfulness and supporting uh, the association. I've appreciated getting to know your pastor on the board and over the years, and and uh, just it, it's it's a blessing to be able to to, to work together in those things. Um, but as as I've had opportunity to travel, um, we I've seen too the truth that we have some churches in our association that are that are struggling. Uh, we've seen churches in our area um, close. Uh, well, I'm, well, I'm up north. I've, I've pastored in Pecatonica, which is a little town outside of Rockford, Illinois. Um, and way up north there. We're only about 12 miles from Wisconsin. Um, and the um, Lord has blessed us, but we've seen some churches in some of the small towns um, fail and, and uh, close down. And that's a sad, that's a sad day. Um, but I also realized that there was a day when every little town needed a church. Uh, people didn't travel. And I don't know that that's the case anymore, but um, so the Lord knows, uh, but there are some churches that we are endeavoring to, uh, to help. I appreciate the vision that the board has had and the churches have had to put some money aside to help churches. We've been able to do some projects for churches. Uh, 
Um, the church in Henry um, was was hit by lightning and and uh, needed a computer and just just some different things that uh, we've been able to do some roof uh, repairs in some churches and now to be able to support um, the church First Baptist Church in Oregon um, as they have seen some real struggles their pastor came Pastor David Snow his wife Janet um, came to the church about two months before COVID hit. And uh, if you know, of course, it was hard on all of us, but I don't think anybody worse than a new pastor. Um, can't create a relationship, can't, uh, can't really, you know, get, get, get in and get to know your people. And uh, Satan really used that in some different things. And the church has gone down to just uh, 10 or 15 people. And then this last year, he's seen three of those people pass away. Um, just, it just seems like it has really uh, attacked it. But God is, God is doing some good things. Um, we have a church up north that, near us that is sending people on a weekly basis. Um, we've gone down, helped them with VBS, and done some different things. They saw a family, a new family come because of VBS. And a young man, one of their sons got saved. And I think God's going to do some great things. And we're treating that church like a, like a church or a replant, if you will. Uh, at least for a year, and we'll see how God how God does and what what, what God wants to do. Uh, but we are we are endeavoring to help them, uh, to lift them up, to encourage them, to strengthen them, so that they can continue and go forward in the in the work of God. Uh, we believe I believe that Oregon needs a a church. It's a good sized town, and uh, God has done some good things there. They've had some uh, pastors over the years that have started. Uh, I think before the association, but about the same time as ours was, about 1959 or so. And God is, uh, has, they've had been large at times. They've, they've seen some good things, but again, um, some different things have, have occurred uh, to cause it to go down. So we're praying for that church. And the Lord has used that in my heart at least. And I, I want to give you tonight just some, some uh, insight. You know, we say as Baptists, one of the things that we... Um, we lay out, if I were to ask you what the Baptist distinctives are, the first one is the Bible is our only what? Rule of faith and practice, right? The Bible is our only rule of faith and practice. What, what do we say? Well, we say, well, the Word of God is where we get what we do. Um, some people believe that the Bible is, is strictly descriptive. But the Bible is not just descriptive, it's prescriptive. It tells us not only what happened, but how we can do things. Now, I know culture changes. Things change over the years. And so, you, you know, you come to a place where you try to do things. We want to do things biblically. Sometimes our means, uh, there's no TVs and, you know, PowerPoints and, and in Scripture. And that's a wonderful thing. We use those. And it's, it's important for us to be able to, uh, to take what the Bible says and apply it um, in, our, in our churches and I believe, as you look at Scripture, that you'll find that the model of churches helping churches, churches even at times supporting churches, and I'm not talking about denominations. I'm not talking about um, control. I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, I, I believe in the local church. I believe in the, in the uh, pastor-led congregational uh, model of, of, a, of a church, as you see in Scripture, and God wants us to, to go forward that way. But there are times, and we, even though we're independent, we cannot, we cannot be isolated. And there are churches that need, that need our help, that we can help with. Um, as well as we do it, we do it around the world, again, with foreign missions, and I think it's important we do it uh, locally as well. Um, so as, as you look at this um, tonight, the first thing we see here in Matthew 16, 18, of course, is that Jesus made the statement and made the, made the promise, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'll build my church. He said, thou art Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church, talking of himself. And so as he gathered his disciples, as he brought them together, he started what we would call the church age. We live in that age. We, we have a a. Uh, a time in which God has using and is using and has used the local church to bring about his purpose in this world. Now, he's even given us a timeline. We won't take the time to, to look at it all, but in Acts chapter 1, 
Bible, we're given the Great Commission, and we'll see that more in just a minute. But we're given the Great Commission. Jesus, as he died, he rose again. He told the disciples. He gave them their marching orders, if you will. He told the church what our purpose was. And that is teaching, right? Seeing people saved, evangelism. Seeing them gathered into the churches, baptize them, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them all things, to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. What, what is that? That's discipleship. So the job of the church is to see people saved, see them gathered into churches, and then ultimately to teach them all things, to mature them into the image of Christ. So God has given us that marching order, if you will. And he tells us how long we're supposed to do it. In Acts chapter 1, we find that after he gives the Great Commission and reminds them of that, what does he do? He ascends into heaven. Now the disciples stand there with their mouth gaping, as you and I would as well, and they're looking into heaven and they're wondering what's, what's happening. And the angel stands there and what does the angel say? Men, why are you standing here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come again in like manner as you've seen him go. We look for the rapture, don't we, amen? amen? If I were to ask you tonight, is the rapture going to happen soon? Invariably, you would say, absolutely, it can't be much longer. But you know, folks, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul thought. That's exactly what the church of Thessalonica thought. They, they so much thought that God was coming in their lifetime that they thought they had missed the rapture. And they, they had come to a place where they, they thought they had missed it, and Paul has to teach them. That's why he gives them 1 Thessalonians 4, that Jesus is coming back. He's going to take those who are dead in Christ. He's going to take those who are alive and remain. And he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus said... From the time he left till the time he comes back is that church age. That local church is his purpose. That starting churches, gathering churches, seeing people saved, seeing them discipled, seeing them gathered together, that's his. And when he comes back, we're done. We'll be taken. The rapture will take place. Folks, you understand that we, that hasn't happened yet, right? Therefore, we still have the Great Commission. We're still responsible until he comes again. I say it just about everywhere I go. God is not done in Illinois. You say, oh, boy, I appreciate what Pastor prayed earlier. We can complain all we want about politics. We can talk about this. We can talk about that. But the truth is, not every person that's going to get saved in Illinois has gotten saved. And we know that because Christ hasn't come back. And until he does, you're going to have VBS, amen? We're going to see kids saved. We're going to see teenagers saved. We're going to see adults saved. And we need to keep at it. So the church age continues. Again, as you look at the church and as God has given to us that great commission, he told them, he told them that, he would, that they were to carry out that great commission. They were to take it. And the great commission, again, was... And I apologize for the fact that you can't uh, quite see it. Um, I, think, I think part of the problem is I sent you the wrong file. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, this was an old one. I, I have it blown up in, <laughs> in mine. But anyway, hope you'll, you'll take my word for what it says. Anyway, um, talking about the Great Commission. And I think you understand that every gospel talks about the Great Commission. Every gospel we're given, we're given it in Matthew, we're given it in Mark 16, preach the gospel to every creature, we're given it in Luke, we're given it in John. John, uh, in, in Luke, he says, we're to be witnesses of these things. He says, it is imperative, it is, it is important that the gospel be preached, he says in Luke 24. In John, he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And then we come to Acts chapter 1, and turn over there to Acts chapter 1. I think you probably know the verse, perhaps by heart. But in Acts chapter 1, he says, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and in the othermost part of the earth. Now, we won't take the time to go into all those different things, but obviously Jerusalem was their hometown. Judea was a surrounding area. 
around them. We could liken it perhaps to our county. We could liken it to our state if you want. Um, Samaria had the idea, I think, of cross-culturally. In other words, there was the Samaritans were half Jews and half Gentiles. Nobody wanted to claim them, really. And they were kind of the outcasts, if you will. And he says, listen, you need to still reach the people of Samaria. And so we have opportunities. Sometimes it's through missions. Sometimes it might be uh, through outreaches. Sometimes it's in our own towns. There are different cultures, different races, different peoples. We need to include all of them because God says there's no difference. Amen. So we need to understand that, that we're to reach them all. And then he says the uttermost, the uttermost. And of course, we understand that as foreign missions. God wants us to reach all of them. But one of the things that we forget about sometimes is the idea of both. The word both means completely, or if you will, all at the same time. In other words, we can't wait till we've reached our Jerusalem to reach into Judea. We can't wait till we've reached Judea to reach into Samaria, and we can't wait till we've reached into Samaria to reach the uttermost. I appreciate the fact that you have a missions program. You're, t- you're involved in local missions, certainly in local ministries. That's what VBS is. That's what outreach ministries, as you knock on doors, as you give people the gospel, as you witness personally. We have local ministries. We have ministries beyond in our state and then certainly our country and as we go around the world. We are to take them both at the same time. The Lord allowed my family and I in 1990 to start an independent Baptist church in Long Island, New York. And in doing so, shortly before that, I was an assistant pastor. And shortly before that, as an assistant pastor, our church um, got more involved in missions. Whatever churches do, they can do it however they want. We, we, this was more of a faith promise. And, and we got more involved in missions. And God had spoken to our heart about giving specifically to foreign missions, my wife and I and our family. And so we had an amount that we were, that we were giving to missions. And when God allowed us to start the church in New York, I got a hold, the Lord somehow got a hold of my heart with this verse, both. If I'm going to teach people that I reach and bring into the church to be missions minded, I got to do it right from the beginning. And so we had a missionary that very first year. Now, it helped that it was my brother-in-law and, you know, we, we knew him. And so we had taken our money that we had given to missions and we started giving it um, to our first missionary. Second year we were there, we had a missions conference. We added four more missionaries. I encouraged the people to give. God, can you do that? And in a small church, I, and I, I, people say, well, you know, you should have been full time. and you may, Don't do that until you're full. You know, I, the Lord just blessed. We were talking about it today. You know, when a church gives, God gives. When you go beyond and you give to others, just like your personal life, God gives to the church. Pastor, I saw something in our church that I, I, I still can't explain it really, but during COVID, our missions program grew, grew 25%. Can't explain it, except God did it. Maybe people got a heart. Maybe people thought, you know, we're going to have to reach out some way. Maybe, I, I don't know. But it's continued even now. When the church gives, and I believe, I believe God's blessed our church. People say, well, you know, hey, you're, you're, you're gone. I'm gone at least. I was gone all day today. I'm gone at least one week a month. Um, some Sunday nights, we, we have Sunday afternoon service. My son preaches when I'm gone. Our church has sacrificed for me to do this. But I don't think there's any question that God's blessed our church because of it. It's just, it's just I've, seen God, I've seen God grow it. I've seen God bless it. I've seen God do great things. When you give, God gives. So we have to be missions-minded. We have to be reaching out around us to reach others for Christ. I want you to see then next that this was carried out in the local church in those early days. Now, again, we can take a lot of time with this, and I'm not going to do that. But you know, in Acts chapter 2, what happened? Day of Pentecost, right? Where was that? Jerusalem, right? So in Jerusalem, the gospel went forth in a miraculous way. And we know that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. 
Now, that, that may have just been the, the male. That, that, it could have been more than that. We know that if you continue reading in the first chapters of the book of Acts, you get to chapter 4, you have multitudes being saved. You have God adding to the church daily such as should be saved. You have thousands more getting saved. And many believe that in that first week, years I should say, of the, of the church at Jerusalem, that it perhaps was as many as 20,000 people. Now, I, I don't know. But obviously they didn't have a mega church. They didn't have a mega church building. They had house churches. They split up into small groups. They came together as they could. But it was thousands of people. We know that they spread out. There were people in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost, and they began to spread out to the Judean wilderness, to the Judean hillside, I should say. All the area around. They went back to their homes. House churches again were started. Things spread out. The gospel began to go forward. If you look at the book of Acts, you find that several times, and through Paul's, re Paul's letters, several times he refers to the Judean churches. So it wasn't just Jerusalem. It was Judea as well. So you have Jerusalem, you have Judea being reached. We come to Acts chapter 8, and if you'll remember what happens, persecution because of Saul, Stephen's death in chapter 7, chapter 8, you find they were scattered. The, the persecution came, and it caused the church to scatter. But the Bible says they went everywhere preaching the gospel. So they took the gospel with them. We find that in chapter 8, you have Philip the evangelist begins to go to Samaria. Okay? So now we got Jerusalem, we got Judea, we got Samaria getting the gospel. It doesn't stop there, though, does it? You get to Acts chapter 10, and Peter's on the rooftop, and a sheet comes down from heaven with all the animals in it, pigs and whatever else. That, and God says, the voice from heaven says, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, not so, Lord. And God says, what I have called clean, call not thou unclean. So what's he saying? Everybody, anybody can be saved. There's no difference. Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, everybody. And the gospel begins to spread. And before long, the church at Antioch becomes the focus of the gospel and you have Barnabas and you have Saul going out of the church at Antioch to take and to carry out the Great Commission from town to town, place to place. And so we find that the Apostle Paul begins his missionary journeys. As you read the letters that he writes, as you read the book of Acts, you see that three journeys were taken. You see that sometimes he was starting new churches. Sometimes he was encouraging other churches, but he was ordaining elders. He was helping them. He was, sometimes he'd be there for six months, sometimes a year, sometimes two years. It, it just depended. And invariably he'd get run out of town and he'd go to the next one. But he continued the work. We know that he and Barnabas split in Acts 15 and they went different ways and did different things. But God continued to work and churches continued to be started and Paul's missionary journeys are really that beginning of the church. It's where we get our le the epistles. It's where we get the letters and things that he wrote to these churches and to pastors like Timothy and Titus and, and to, to Philemon and, and, and others. As he wrote to them, as he encouraged them, as he strengthened them, the church goes forward. But you know, as the Apostle Paul traveled around, one of the things you see in his letters is that he uses one church to be an example or a testimony to another church. And I want you to see that tonight as we look at it a little bit. Again, I wish you could see what I have up there. Pretty small, too small, sorry. Um, but I'll give it to you here. And if you want to write it down or you know, pastor can give you the file, you can look at it later on. Um, look at First Thessalonians, if you would, chapter 1. Paul is going to use, and, and I want you to note with me, take note with me, the different areas or towns that he mentions in these verses. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 6, it says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. What happened? They got saved. People of Thessalonica, there was a lot of persecution, a lot of pressure, but they got saved. 
and, and a great things happen. Verse 7, so that ye were in samples or examples to all that believe in what? Macedonia and Achaia. Okay? Take note of that. Macedonia and Achaia. All right? So in Macedonia and Achaia, through the testimony of the church of Thessalonica, the churches in Macedonia and Achaia heard that testimony and it caused them to be encouraged. It caused many people to get saved. It caused the churches to go forward for him. He says, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God, to God's word is spread abroad so that you need not to speak anything. Do you know that your church and, and, and the fact of your salvation and your, your testimony is the greatest tool that you have to witness to somebody else? It's a wonderful tool just to simply tell somebody what Christ did for you. Luke 24, Jesus made it clear that they were to use their own witness. He says, whereof ye are witnesses. Of what? Of salvation. Why? Because he saved you. I don't think there's any greater tool than to tell somebody, you know what Christ did for me? And it doesn't even have to be some spectacular testimony. I'm thankful that Christ, God saved me at five years old. I'm thrilled about that. I can tell anybody that. Look what God's done in my life. Look how God has used me. Look how God has done because he saved me. You have a testimony. You have a witness. The people of Thessalonica, Thessalonica did as well. And everywhere Paul went, he used their testimony as a tool to win others. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse 14, the Bible says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the church of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as ye have of the Jews. Who was a testimony to the church of Thessalonica? The churches in Judea. It started in Jerusalem, right? Day of Pentecost, thousands were saved. They spread out to their Judean homes. They went to their places. The churches in Judea faced tremendous persecution in Acts chapter 8. As they scattered and as they still stood for God, as they still lived the testimony, as they still went on for the Lord, Paul used that as a testimony to the church in Thessalonica. And he challenged them. Listen, you know what God did in Judea? Look what God, how God blessed in Judea. Look how God, look what God did here. And he can do the same thing for you. And it worked. And the church of Thessalonica then was a testimony where? Macedonia and Achaia. So we've spread, haven't we? We've gone from Jerusalem to Judea to Thessalonica to Macedonia and Achaia. And God continues to work. All right? Look with me, if you would, at 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. I think you know that the Bible is not given to us necessarily in chronological order. So we're jumping around a little bit to get a timeline here. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15. He says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Stephanus and his household were some of the first people saved in the church in, the church in Achaia. Now, remember, where was Thessalonica a testimony? Macedonia and Achaia. Now we find Stephen got saved through the ministry of the church in Achaia who heard about the testimony of the people in Thessalonica who heard from the people in Judea who heard from the people in Jerusalem. He goes on, verse 19. He said, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So we find here the churches of Asia. Many believe that Asia and Achaia were basically the same area. So we have Aquila and Priscilla 
with a church in their house, in their home, and we know that they ministered with Paul and traveled around with him oftentimes. They were tent makers like he was. And God used them in different places. But the testimony that they had of the church in their house, in Asia, in Achaia, which also reached Stephen, and now, again, we go on from there. So God has, has reached into these different places. He's used this. We could go, and, and again, there's other places. We could go to Phil, Philippians uh, 4, where Paul talks about how the church of Philippi uh, met his needs. They, they, they sent to his need. Um, he wants fruit that abounds to their account. He wants to use them. He uses them as a testimony. But I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse one. The Bible says, "Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves." And he goes on. He talks about how that he gave their own selves to the Lord and. Uh, he, he talks about how they gave out of their poverty and what a testimony that was. But again, who was a testimony to the churches of Macedonia? Thessalonica. Thessalonica from Judea, Judea, Judea from Jerusalem. And again, the testimony of these churches is helping others. Now, I want you to see then tonight, and this is, this is really where we're trying to get for just as we see what scripture was, is telling us, when it came down to it, before long, as the Apostle Paul had been involved in starting all these churches and doing all this, this church work, and one church is helping another, and one church is a testimony to another, and he, he, he's challenging them, and he challenges the churches of Macedonia to be givers, and they, they give of themselves, and they give of their poverty, and they give beyond measure, beyond their ability. When you come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, or you come back to what the Lord has, has given us, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we find that as he goes to these churches, he begins to take an offering. And he begins to take an offering from the churches of Macedonia, from the churches in Achaia, from Corinth, from Thessalonica, from these other churches. What's he doing? Verse 1, he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have give order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him. Let there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. But Jerusalem was 20,000 people. Jerusalem at one time was huge. Jerusalem's where it all began. Jerusalem is, is where people got saved. It's where it all came from. How in the world can just Jerusalem need to be helped by these other churches? And I believe that's the lesson for us. The church has come full circle. Again, not control, not authority, but love and concern and help. Paul is collecting a monetary, financial offering, gift, that he is going to take to Jerusalem. He wants people from these churches, from Corinth and from these other churches, to come with him as representatives. And he wants them to come and he wants them to show their love and the, the Macedonian churches and, and all these people to give of the, themselves for the church at Jerusalem. Jerusalem's where it all began. But through the persecution, through the difficulty, and we're not told exactly all the things that happened. We're not given all the instruction. We're not even given how Paul came to this conclusion. We know that he's been there. Um, I've been preaching through the book of Acts in our Sunday morning uh, services. And Acts 15, he goes to Jerusalem. They, they discuss the gospel and so forth. Um, he has respect for the church of Jerusalem. He, he sees, certainly sees at that point what's going on in Jerusalem. But we don't know how he came to this place other than the Holy Spirit 
instructed him to take this offering for the church at Jerusalem. That's been a challenge to me, to see the church come full circle, to see God do something through our churches to help another church or to help other churches. I realize that we can't do everything for every other church. I, I believe with all my heart that God uses the local church. He wants to finance the local church through the local church, through the tithes and offerings of its people. I get that. But there are circumstances and things at times where I think God wants to use us to simply, out of love, out of concern for the gospel, out of concern for the local church, to just simply be a help and a blessing. And I don't know how God will lead us in the future. I, I, I pray, I hope that he will continue to give us church planters, that we see churches started. But I also realize that until he comes, we have to prop up at times churches. And we need to be a blessing. We need to be a help. Uh, we can do that by our manpower. We can do it through prayer. We can do it through testimony. We can do it through help in some way or another. Um, I realize that you're not going to come to Oregon, Illinois, probably. Uh, you're, you're three hours away, um, and, and it's not as easy for you. We, we are trying to help. We're not far away. We're, we're trying to be a, a blessing to them. But I appreciate our association being able to give to them financially, being able to meet their needs, and that does come out of your gifts and that you're giving. And so I want you to understand why, if you will, we're doing that. Um, we're not trying to just throw money at things and make them, it's not possible. We know how churches are built. But it is important for us to, be, to understand, to be praying. And I hope you'll pray. I hope you'll pray for the church at Oregon. I hope you'll pray for some of our smaller churches. Uh, maybe you know some personally, you're involved with some personally. Um, to be a blessing, to be a testimony to them. And to pray for men to start churches, for, for churches to start churches, to, to get a burden for an area or a group of people or, or whatever the case might be, but to, to take and to, to do the work of God that he's given us to do. And we have to continue until he comes again. And I hope that it will challenge you and encourage you how God blesses us. If God blesses you and God blesses us and we need to be givers beyond our ability, beyond all that God has has done with us. We need to be faithful uh, to reach and to reach out and to reach into the heart and lives of others.